Thank you, everyone. So I'm very lucky to speak right after great presenter from NIST, because I think it dovetails extremely well with what we've just heard. Um, so I'd like to tell you about our homomorphic encryption standardization effort, our community that we've built over the last two years. Uh, it's excellent timing, because we actually just had our fourth standardization workshop yesterday at Intel in Santa Clara, co-located with Usenix, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, if there's one thing that you can remember or take away from this talk is that we actually have published a draft standard for homomorphic encryption, which was approved by our community uh, about a year ago uh, last November. And not only it's been available online, and people tell us that they use it and there have been a lot of references, but I actually just put it on ePrint. So it's just uh, appearing on ePrint like today, so you can access it. So um, another key piece of information that you should know about our community is that uh, it's very open, so you're all welcome. So you can go to the website, it's homomorphicencryption.org, and um, you can add yourself to the mailing list. So uh, we actually try to keep the traffic very low on the mailing list. It pertains primarily just to our uh, standardization um, organizing efforts, so you don't have to worry if you join that you'll be inundated. Uh, because there's many um, working groups or sub-mailing lists that you can also join for specific topics. But the main one, uh, standards uh, at homomorphicencryption.org, we have more than 300 people on our mailing list now. So it's a, a growing community. Uh, so the main organizers of this effort, it started at Microsoft Research, uh, with my team collaborating with um, Microsoft Research Outreach, uh, so the, the people that have been co-organizers for all the workshops so far are Kim Lina from the Cryptography Group, a researcher in my team, myself and Roy, and um, Kim has done the lion's share of the work, especially in the uh, uh, recent workshop yesterday. And um, for the thir second, third, and fourth workshops uh, co have been co-organized with uh, duality technologies. So. Kurt Roloff and uh, Yuri Polikov, but um, we've had co-organizers from a number of different um, institutions in the, diff the four different workshops. So for example, Lily Chen from NIST was a co-organizer of the first one. Um, we've had, uh, the second one was hosted at MIT. Um, Jung Hee Chan was a co-organizer of the first one also. Second one um, was hosted by Vinod Vaikatanathan at MIT and he was a co-organizer for the first three workshops. Glenn Gulak at Toronto, Kazimir Wyszynski at uh, Intel, and Juan Transcoso from EPFL. So you can see a wide range of people and um, institutions are represented in the, in the actual formal organizing committee, but we've had a great deal of input from all different um, directions, both researchers and companies in, in our effort. So um, for one thing, I put a partial list of kind of government agencies and standardization bodies who have been involved at um, uh, being at panels or giving short presentations. Uh, so uh, certainly NIST was represented at all three of the, f the first three, but unfortunately for our timing with the NIST workshop happening this weekend, uh, Lily was not able to attend uh, yesterday. But um, NIH uh, participated in the first three workshops. Um, NSA has been represented, um, I think, in the first three. NSF, the Canadian Security Establishment, um, Canadian ministries such as Ministry of Health asked uh, to be invited to the one in Toronto. Um, for example, the Korean Credit Bureau came to the one at MIT and representatives from U the UNITU working group. So we've had a lot of interest from um, both you know, standardizing bodies and government agencies. And um, people at NSA have actually told us that having our sta standard available online has been extremely useful to them because they can pass around this document internally in the classified environment and reason about the status quo and the, and the status. So, um, so this was the first workshop. So this is how we kind of got this, work, this effort off the ground. I mean, honestly, we had been talking about it um, for a couple of years with um, people including um, Kurt at uh, Duality and Shai Halevi at IBM and Vinod Baikatanathan at MIT. 
And the way that we actually got it off the ground is Microsoft funded it. We had Microsoft Outreach uh, brought 36 people to campus. It was invitation only. It was three groups of 12. And it was not a, like, um, it was not a junket. It was a working conference. It was, two, it was basically two days in which, in groups of 12, we wrote three white papers. We actually wrote them in two days. And that was possible because we were bringing experts in this area together and setting the expectation that we wanted to get something done. And we just worked really hard. And so uh, within about two weeks of the workshop, we said, we kind of threatened everyone, we're putting these white papers online. So if you want to make comments, if you want to make changes, you know, they're just white papers, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, we weren't uh, trying to be bullies, but we just wanted to make sure that there was some, some concrete outcomes. And so these white papers went online almost immediately. And the way it was divided was one that was, one working group focused on security, one focused on APIs, and one focused on applications. And so um, what we did was um, the, uh, we kind of decided on the, the next workshop. So the next workshop was at MIT in March of 2018. So it was you know, roughly nine months later. And what we had kind of decided at the first workshop was that we, dis we discussed a lot of different paths to standardization. And since we had many of the relevant people in the room, there were many other experts in homomorphic encryption who had also been invited but who couldn't come. And we also wanted to capture their input as well. So we decided, that's when we decided to create the website, create the mailing list, and try to make it an open community and um, solicit input from as many people as possible. And we decided among the standardization efforts open to us, the only one that we can control is to create our own kind of essentially uh, de facto standard. Basically, it's like an industry consortium. So our group, homomorphicencryption.org, currently has no governance. It's a completely open volunteer effort. And so that has really good parts to it, being, you know, anybody can join, anybody can contribute. We ask for volunteers at every meeting. People step up and volunteer to help with different things, uh, preparing documents, giving presentations, all kinds of things. So that's great. Um, but we don't have the structure that a standardization body has or a, a government agency has. So, and whatever we create, there's nothing is binding. It's only, the, you know, the recommendations that people and the community can see that, there, you know, there's a consortium of people that have created these, uh, this document. On the other hand, um, on the flip side, because, you know, because it's very open and collaborative, we've had really great participation from companies actually around the world. And uh, industry participants' participation has been kind of skyrocketing, meeting after meeting over meeting. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that um, it's an attractive venue for people to come to learn about homomorphic encryption. So engineers and they, you know, can ask questions about things like interoperability or certification, accreditation, that type of stuff. And um, it also has been, honestly, a place where um, people can come who are looking for jobs. And pe students come, and they, we always have a very active poster session. There's a number of students that have gotten hired through connections that they've made at these workshops. So it's really, a com it functions as a community on a lot of different levels. Um, so uh, the draft standard that um, we came out of, of the, um, the first workshop let me, let me tell you how we kind of decided how to proceed. So we had these three tracks, security, APIs, and applications. And we kind of said to ourselves, well, nothing can happen without people having confidence in the underlying mathematics and the underlying hard problem. And of all the libraries that exist um, in the world for public key or for homomorphic uh, encryption, they were all based on RLWE, the ring learning with errors problem, which is related to hard lattice problems. And so we decided to actually standardize the kind of the hard you know, math problem underneath the current uh, versions of homomorphic encryption and really try to set the parameters to achieve certain security levels. So that was our goal because we figured, first of all, that takes time. Once we kind of collect the community's um, you know, knowledge about security levels for lattice-based cryptography, 
and we translate them through, through a lot of concrete work that a lot of different um, computational number theorists have done. Once we translate that into concrete parameters that we propose, um, that those become kind of de facto challenges. So our standard is out there. Anyone can attack any one of those rows in our table. And so now we've, since we've put this out now, um, you know, a year ago, we can stand behind this and ha let the community think about, you know, attacking these and get used to these are the levels that we stand behind. These are the security levels that we think we're achieving with these parameters. And then, so now where um, we're going is how do you build on that? So let me tell you a little bit about, okay, so this was the MIT workshop in March 2018 where we approved the draft standard. We actually asked for co-signers of the meeting. So there's um, actually 16 co-authors on the document and um, there were more than 50 co-signers. So we have like more than 65 co-signers of our standard. Um, and then, um, Actually, after that was a good, uh, I was able to like twist everyone's arm to get the white papers out within two weeks after the first workshop, but I wasn't able to twist everyone's arm to give their input on the uh, standard before the March meeting. And so what we did was we collected quite a lot of input after the um, second workshop and we incorporated, incorporated that into the draft that's now available online that became um, kind of uh, public in November 2018. So um, at the Toronto workshop, we kind of approved, we approved the changes that had been made since the March workshop, and we kind of planned for, for future versions. And um, so what was very exciting is, is that yesterday in Santa Clara, our fourth workshop was hosted by Intel. So in the meantime, you know, based on the SEAL library, so I haven't said much about individual libraries yet, but my team at Microsoft Research has built and released the SEAL homomorphic encryption library. It's available open source under the MIT license, so it's available for commercial use. In particular, Intel has built on this, and they're using this as the engine for their n-graph, which is um, like a machine learning, like deep learning predictions. And there's a number of other uh, companies that have started to either use it or write press releases or experiment with it. So this, this um, Intel's uh, kind of partnership on this was really great to see them step up and say that they wanted to host this uh, workshop at, at Intel. And it was co-located with uh, Usenix Security, which was in Santa Clara last week. Um, and so in each of these workshops, uh, the second, third, and fourth workshops, we've had about 70 participants. And um, it's uh, worth taking a note of that because, as I said, the first one, when we kickstarted this effort, we invited everyone to Microsoft, to, to, uh, to Redmond, and paid for everyone to come, everyone who could accept payment. Every workshop since then, there's been no funding for travel. Every participant has paid for their own travel to come to these workshops, and we've had about 70 people at each one. And um, another thing that was really remarkable about um, yesterday's workshop is that um, the, uh, so there were actually more than uh, ni 19 or more companies that were there, um, and which was an increase over um, previous, previous ones. So um, what did we do yesterday? Uh, so we kind of um, discussed, we kind of reviewed possible extensions to the security standard. Uh, we discussed the next steps for kind of standardizing the schemes, the homomorphic encryption schemes that are used by the different libraries. There's about four different schemes, all based on the hardness of RLWE, which is uh, related to hard lattice problems. And um, we, dis uh, we also discussed a governance proposal, possibly formalizing our community a little bit more, and um, some other issues. Uh, the, one of the big uh, issues always at each workshop is where is the next one going to be? And so we actually have three proposals, teams wanting to host the next one, which is also a great sign that there's a lot of support and interest in being involved in this community. So Seoul National University and Samsung are very interested in hosting this in Korea, and we think we can connect with a lot of Asian companies and um, uh, you know, possibly regulators as well. And we, um, we have a proposal from EPFL and a startup called Infer 
um, to host it in Switzerland, uh, possibly co-located with the UN ITU um, AI for Good Summit that they're having in May. This would be right before um, Eurocrypt. So we have a couple of um, possible next steps for the next workshop. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, so we plan to continue kind of working, uh, having these workshops on this cadence. Um, so, I mean, just a couple of notes that I put up here. This was the, the Toronto workshop, is that, um, you know, uh, as you could kind of hear in the previous talk, I mean, open standards in cryptography are kind of preferable because since cryptography is inherently secret, I mean, somehow the community and the public needs to understand whether they should trust some new crypto that's coming along. And so uh, we feel that open standards are really preferable and the standardization process creates trust. It's currently creating trust between many of us in our community, between companies and government agencies and researchers. Um, but also a lot of regulated industries require standardization and they will eventually require some kind of certification process. So that's what we're aiming for in the longer term, like let's say in the 10 year time frame. Um, so um, um, what I wanted to do is to just tell you a little bit about the resources for you to, to get involved if you're interested. So this is kind of an important point, so I put this up front. So if you go to the homomorphicencryption.org website, what, what will you find there? You can find uh, like links to all of the workshops, links to the white paper, links to the standards, so those are really important. But there's also other things like, you know, lists of all the publicly available libraries, the news and events, things, uh, things like that. Um, so you can actually send any comments on the website or whatever to this email contact. Um, or if you want to volunteer or just ask a question or whatever, you can send us an email. Um, you can opt in or out of the news channel or, or other channels that we have. And we also have a Twitter handle. So for example, from yesterday's uh, workshop, we have a ton of tweets online with covering you know, what, the content, what content was being presented and pictures and stuff. Um, so uh, just to kind of give you an idea, for those of you that are not really familiar, there are a number of publicly available homomorphic encryption libraries in the world, and it has evolved quite fast in the last five years or so. So the first one that was publicly available was from IBM, HE Lib, so Shai Halevi and his collaborators, and Shai has been a major contributor and co collaborator for these, this series of workshops. Um, so uh, it was widely used by, uh, by researchers and based on the BGV scheme. Um, is starting uh, in 2015, Microsoft SEAL has been publicly available for research, and as of 2018, it was open, it's released under the open source license for the MIT license for commercial use as well. Um, SEAL is designed to be a very robust, well-engineered, and well-documented library that's intended for uh, commercial use and we've gotten a lot of good feedback on it over time. Um, there are a number of other libraries such as NFL Lib that was developed at Crypto Experts. I, is, um, Tancred had to step out, I think, but um, Tancred worked on that. Palisade uh, from 2017 on was, has been developed, I think, with funding from a DARPA grant. So Yuri Polikov and, um, and Kurt Roloff are uh, major uh, developers for that. There's a GPU library coming out of um, Worcester Polytechnic. Um, it's QHE. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, there's the library coming out of Seoul National University, Heian, which supports approximate arithmetic. Um, that's been available since 2017. And then there's also a, a slightly different approach, which is based on kind of bootstrapping after every gate, the FUSE scheme and library that came out in 2015 from Daniele Michiancio. And, um, and Leo Duca, and now the TFHE is, in a sense, a, a, an extension of that work. TFHE has been available since 2017. Um, and the, um, the infra team that's been developing um, uh, TFHE was, has been represented at our workshop. So um, Maria and uh, Nicola and, and Dimitar was, were all there yesterday. So we found out about one more library yesterday that I didn't know about. Latigo has now been um, developed at EPFL for um, uh, a specific application that they're trying to do in the medical sector, and that was very interesting to hear about. Um, so as I said, these were 
this, this was to begin with. These are our, our principles. Um, we want it to standardize the security first. Um, sorry about that. And then to move on to APIs and applications. And so we're basically on step two so now, step two and three. And um, these are, we've stuck with our original principles of kind of open uh, participation, uh, communication. We, we send out emails via the mailing list. For example, when the draft standard is ready or when we want to start a new working group to work on some particular project, emails go out saying who would like to volunteer or could you please give your input or this will be voted on at the next workshop, can you please send comments by such and such a time. So that's kind of how it works. And then approval is done usually by things like a show of hand and stuff at the workshops. So one thing I want to make sure to do is to, to show you a, just a couple of the pages from the document. Um, and like I said, the history of the document was that at the first workshop we decided that we would just create this uh, de facto standard and um, circulate it and get feedback and then approve it. And um, like I said, we got a lot of input in the meantime from people other than the first uh, 12 authors. So there's 16 co-authors on the document. Um, so this is just the first page of the document. It's called the Homomorphic Encryption Stan Standard. It's at HES or HES 1.0 in a sense. It's the first version. We expect this to evolve over time. So we also wanted to set the expectation that we're choosing our security parameters very conservatively based on currently known estimates for attacks. We expect, of course, attacks to evolve a little bit over time. Um, unless we get an incredibly disruptive new attack, uh, we expect these parameters to be safe for quite a while and to be able, we could potentially, if needed, modify them slightly, like gradually over time. So that would be the plan in the absence of a disruptive attack on lattice problems. And so we tried to kind of set that expectation. We also have um, post-quantum security for these lattice problems, and we've actually officially asked NIST, if, 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 as part of the PQC process, if we could potentially standardize a larger range of parameters that allow for homomorphic encryption instead of just the smaller parameters that you would use for key exchange. So we'll see what I mean by that when I go to this slide. Okay, so sorry, this is just the first table in the end of the document. Sorry for all, all the numbers here, but if you just look at, for example, the first line. So what's happening here is we have three different tables depending on how you choose the secret for your encryption. And here, the most uh, obviously a secure approach is to choose the uh, secret vector uniformly at random. So this is the uniform secret table. That's why it says uniform in the upper left corner. That's the distribution for the secret. And then like the minimum lattice dimension that you would do anything with for homomorphic encryption is 1024. So the first line is if you want to use a 1024-bit lattice and you want, or bit, um, 1024 dimensional lattice, and you want to have um, a security level of 128 bits, then you should choose your, um, uh, your modulus, your um, log Q should be um, no more than 29 bits. So what that means is, is that um, in practice, you're going to have some homomorphic computation that you want to do. The way homomorphic encryption works is that once you start computing on ciphertext, the error grows and the plain text grows. And so what happens is, is that there's a limit to how much computation you can do without refreshing in some way. And so what, what, what'll happen is, from an implementer's point of view, if they want to do some concrete task, they'll look and see, oh, what's the task that I want to do? How big is my data? How big of a, basically a, a kind of a coefficient modulus Q do I need? And so what you would then do is to kind of look at this column here, and you go kind of down this column and, until you hit the Q that you need. Like you need a Q that's at least so large, but these are saying for these rows, Q can be no larger than these values. So, so then let's say you think you need like, um, you know, like a 440-bit Q or 400-bit Q or something, so you would go down to this row of the table and you would say, oh, okay, this Q, that'll be large enough for me. 
And if I want 128-bit security, that means I need to use lattice dimension, which is 16K. And, um, and the, the largest one that we have in the tables today is 32K. One thing we discussed yesterday is adding some rows here to allow for even bigger lattice dimension. But with 32K, um, in, by and large, we think that you can do bootstrapping with 32K bits. And so initially, we thought that 32, I'm sorry, 32,000 um, dimension. And so um, we thought that that might be sufficient, but there are various implementers asking for a little bit more room to do more. So we'll probably add more, more rows to this table. Um, so that kind of should give you an idea that it's a, it's a longish document, like uh, 30 plus pages, and it has two sections. It has a, a section which is just um, giving basics of the schemes, the BGV and the BF schemes, and pointing to some alternatives such as GSW. Um, but then the, the primary content of the document is describing all the known attacks on lattice problems um, and describing our, um, both our methodology and our reasoning as to which, um, uh, you know, which parameters, cho choices that we uh, wanted to standardize and stand behind. So for example, all the homomorphic encryptions are using uh, schemes that today are using ring LWE. And um, so we only standardize two power cyclotomic rings because we have better attacks on other types of rings, including general cyclotomics. So in, in, in my experience, when you already have kind of new or devastating attacks in some, for some types of choices, um, you'll, those attacks will only improve over time. And so we stayed away for, and from any parameter choices that we thought would be kind of risky. So we only standardize uh, two power cyclotomic rings. Um, uh, we have cho you know, guidance on how to choose the error distribution for homomorphic encryption. We give our rationale for what cost models we use for modeling the cost of the different attacks. So we have a lot of explanations of that nature in the, in the second half of the document before, before the tables. Okay, so now that our standard is um, public and, and online, and now it will even be on ePrint as of today, um, the next steps uh, are we have quite a few issues. So like I said yesterday, we had a discussion about governance, whether we want to have a more um, formal structure of steering committee and working groups, because right now it's all volunteer, all very ad hoc, um, basically run by the that I listed on the first slide, plus in consultation with other advisors that have been heavily involved in the workshops and through sending out emails on the mailing list. Um, there are, of course, people have brought up IPR issues. So right now, there's no IPR policy in our community. We do not have um, anything stating we request people disclose their patents. Um, so participation in this, that it's a good and a bad. I mean, every company that's participating there, they're allowed, they can participate without being required to disclose their patents. Um, so, and also no company is actually um, contributing anything to the standard. The standard itself is just an academic document so far that's collecting knowledge. But once we move into the schemes and uh, optimis, optimal versions you know, of implementations of the schemes and also into the applications, there's also a potential there to run into patent issues. So IPR is definitely an issue that is on the table that we're talking about, how it should be handled. Um, white, we want to have uh, actually individual white papers describing each of the main schemes instead of the current, you know, very, very minimal specification that's in the first document. So there's going to be separate working groups for BGB, VFV, CKKS, and TFHE, and we're going to try to have some kind of uniformity in terms of the level of exposition and what's included in those different um, specifications. I feel that those will be very important for going forward for example, to uh, propose a standardization effort at IETF, they would most likely want to standardize the schemes, and so we want to have very good descriptions of the schemes written. Um, and so we're just starting on the applications track, trying to formalize that. 
So yesterday, uh, Juan Troncoso from EPFL presented uh, the work that they did building on their Medco project. So in Switzerland, they have uh, brought together a consortium of seven Swiss hospitals that are using a protocol that they designed, which includes homomorphic encryption as one of the building blocks, and which they had implemented and deployed and kind of learned from. And so they did the exercise Juan presented uh, yesterday, I think it's not quite public yet, of translating their technical paper into an RFC kind of a document. So a protocol, it's like a draft standard of a protocol for using homomorphic encryption for a purpose in the medical sector. And so we're really pleased because that's the first example of an application being built on top of our standard. There's been a couple of other instances where our standard has been referred to and used in the ongoing IDASH competitions, which are funded by NIH. So NIH has been funding for more than five years a group of academics and researchers at UCSD and uh, uh, UT Health in Houston and Indiana to run a competition every year it's called Secure Genome Analysis Competition. And they put out data sets of genomic data and they create challenges and they say, here's the homomorphic encryption challenge for this year. And last year, they actually referred to our standard asking for everyone to comply with the standard and use 128-bit security for their solution. So that was a nice way to bring all the solutions from, these are teams from all over the world um, and bringing them all together to, to a, some kind of common foundation. So that's another way that our standard is already being used. Um, there's a couple of other issues that um, are definitely things that we're going to probably struggle with over time, which are things like interoperability of libraries and certification or accreditation of libraries and solutions. Uh, a lot of the engineers from different companies in the room yesterday were repeatedly bringing up these, these questions. Um, and so then, you know, just as a review of kind of like the way we're thinking about standardization, there's a lot of paths to standardization. We started with just uh, essentially a consortium, you know, an open industry consortium. And we feel like we've made a lot of progress. We're really happy. I mean, we also really enjoy our community. It's a great community. Um, but the whole goal was to have other agencies and other standardizing bodies build on this standard. Um, and we're in the process of thinking about how do we go and propose, you know, starting with maybe birds of a feather session at an IETF meeting, um, work, uh, joining one of the working groups at the UN ITU, uh, working together with NIST. I mean, we, we've uh, actually, Daniel uh, was at our third workshop. Um, and I mentioned Lily had co-organized our first, and Dustin Moody is a, a co-author on this document. So we'd really love to, to work together with NIST. We feel that it also overlaps with the ongoing PQC competition, since we're trying to standardize lattice problems, which are the same lattice problems that are used for key exchange. There are several differences in terms of parameter size and error distribution. But um, by and large, it, it fits very well with the current PQC um, process for NIST. And it's also a big incentive for companies that are thinking about having to transition to uh, post-quantum solutions anyway to have that homomorphic encryption option um, on the table. So uh, we have kind of a lot of different options. And um, I'm hoping that we'll continue to work with some of the specific communities, such as the medical community, uh, NIH, that we've partnered with so far, and also things like the financial services community. So inclusion, I'd like to say that one thing that's been really important for us in this area of homomorphic encryption is talent development. So we're really lucky at Microsoft Research. We have an awesome intern program. So we have many, many interns every summer. But we want, it's hard to bring, in, to bring in PhD students who already have a lot of expertise in both cryptography and applications that we're working on, such as machine learning and, and all kinds of things. So we're actually doing, um, we're starting something new. We're going to try this December. We're doing a private AI boot camp. And we're actually intending to bring um, 30 PhD students from around the co country who are um, in any area, they don't have to be crypto researchers. So this could be PhD students that are primarily focusing on machine learning or privacy or security or whatever. 
And so we're going to try to have tutorials on how to use SEAL, uh, uh, tutorials on privacy preserving machine learning, a lot of different uh, aspects of this. So application de deadline is September 15th. I, I realize it's a shameless advertisement, but on the other hand, uh, it's a good opportunity to connect uh, several different threads here. And that is, um, you know, the talent pool development, which is necessary for all of us for, for advanced crypto, and also being very interdisciplinary about it, not just being uh, crypto researchers in isolation, but rather crypto and security researchers that can reason across boundaries and, and collaborate on interdisciplinary projects. So we feel this is very important. And it also feeds very well into our, our standardization effort and our attempt to create, you know, like the title of this workshop, advanced, um, advanced Crypto Standards. So thank you very much for listening. We only have about five minutes for questions, but um, I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. I guess one of the things that we've found uh, uh, most challenging in the ZK proof uh, effort is kind of this idea of benchmarking different constructions. Um, and I'm wondering, like, what is the way that you're uh, putting this out to the community? What are the ways to like benchmark apples to apples, really, right, uh, between protocols? And I guess the iDash competition comes in a bit in there. Yes, so that's an excellent question. So the iDash, uh, we, we almost feel like we've been kind of partnering with the iDash organizers and competition over the last couple of years because they really have been playing that role. For the last five years, the iDash competition, the HE track, has produced benchmark numbers for it. And these aren't just um, like uh, homomorphic encryption, like raw performance numbers. These are numbers that show how it performs in a given environment. The only thing that's a little bit hard to kind of pick apart or decipher is that each team will come up with a solution to the challenge, and these solutions can be different. So it, it's still not necessarily apples to apples when somebody's cho chosen like a machine learning model that you know like converges faster or needs less precision or something like that. But still, that's a set of like five years of tasks where there are benchmark numbers available online. And the papers from those workshops have been published like in Nature Genomics and other you know, top journals. So that's one answer is the IDASH performance numbers. So um, interestingly, I don't think that we have um, necessarily publicly available uh, performance numbers for each one of these libraries on, you know, on, that's on the website. But that being said, there are a lot of scientific papers that the authors of these libraries have um, published giving performance numbers. Another example of where you see like concrete benchmarks is that, um, so in 2016, my team published a paper called CryptoNets in ICML, which shows evaluating um, deep neural nets on in homomorphically encrypted data. And this was you know, three years ago, it was fairly surprising at the time that we could do predictions on homomorphically encrypted data. These are very, very deep circuits. Um, but uh, what has happened since then is an explosion of research in the area. So yesterday, Zhang Hichian presented a table with like 10 different papers that have been published since then from different groups using different libraries, doing, uh, they're you know, basically extending crypto nets, doing uh, deep net uh, uh, evaluation of um, neural nets and giving performance numbers. So you could see on his table uh, the throughput and the latency for each one of the solutions. And they come from papers like CCS last year, crypto last year, like all the top conferences and, and stuff. So that's another example where we do have benchmarks, but not for the raw performance numbers, but rather for the application. I don't know if that answers your question. Or... Yeah. 